Hey everybody, Sam Wise here, your local community herbalist, and today we're talking about Yule. What what is Yule? What is Yule time? <laughs> what is up with this time of the year? Where does it come from? And what does it have to do with Christmas? Um, so yeah, surprise, surprise, Yule has some pagan, um, ultimately Germanic y origins and um yeah, has a lot to do with land spirits and the deities of old. So um, I'm excited to, to jump into it with you. So technically, Yule is the period of time from the winter solstice, which if you're watching this in real time, um, is tomorrow, which is uh, Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. And then 12 days after that, that winter solstice time. Um, some people also say 12 days after the 25th, hence like the 12 days of Christmas, but I'm going to count it after the winter solstice. And yeah, Yule is a time that's really associated with um, the wild hunt, which if folks don't know, in germanic e ish lore has to do with processions of spirits through the land um, in the depths of winter. And some sources say that it has to do with Odin, but I'm really interested in lore that's that's older than than Norse Viking Odin lore. I'm not super into Odin <laughs> personally, but I um I am interested in like the goddess and like mother worship that that came before him. And so yeah, it's really associated with um, a number of deities that go by different names, um, but who are essentially like earth or like land goddesses or um, or one goddess, kind of depends who you ask. Um, but um, yeah, and this idea, the, the kind of patriarchal version of the wild hunt is something to do with dudes and hunting and like going through the landscape and being really scary. Um, but the, the version of that lore that again is older that I'm more interested in is this idea of like a winter spirit or a winter deity that sweeps the landscape looking for lost souls and helps them onto, onto their way to their next iteration of, of life and death and rebirth. And, um, there's two big, uh, deities that I'm aware of, um, in in those realms that um are their name is um percha or um also associated with like birch or bircha and that's kind of like in the upper germanic regions and then there's holda uh who is in the lower germanic regions and so um yeah i'm gonna break that down for us kind of the some people say that they're the same deity but just like located in different geographical regions so some people um yeah say that they're totally different, but who knows? <laughs> so yeah, so Percha or Bircha, again, is associated with Birch, um, which in runes, I understand, has a lot to do with like birth and joy. Um, part of her name is like the bright one or the shining one. And she's known as the guardian of beasts, also spinning. Uh, she's associated with beautiful, like she kind of has, again, like, multiple faces and and one iteration of her is like beautiful and white like the snow so she's a wintertime deity um and then the other like face of her is elderly and kind of hag haggard um there's also this like lore about um that she has like one long foot or um an iron nose there's sort of like a queerness to her um to her appearance and she, in kind of like later lore, is really into rewarding hard work. <laughs> Definitely, I think, meant to encourage, particularly like w people, you know, labeled as women and girls to like keep spinning and keep being productive in the household. So there's all these stories of um, if you're done with all the spinning um, by the end of Yule, uh, you're also supposed to not work on January 6th, which is like supposed to be the end, the end of this period of time and like the goddess's day. If you're done, great, you get rewarded. Um, if you're not done and you're still spinning f fervently on the days that you're not supposed to, um, there's sometimes like punishment. Um, and then there's stories about Percha in particular that I, I think are recycled 
through um, like Christian lenses, lenses that are really interested in, in demonizing or like scaring people away from practicing the old religions um, that have some pretty gruesome stories. Like if you anger Percha, then she'll slit your belly open and stuff you with straw and stones, which is t terrifying. <laughs> but um, yeah, it is interesting that there's this like kind of duality or like multiple faces of the these goddesses because they are both like beautiful like you know like a clean winter day you know where it's crisp and like um kind of like empty in a way um but also like you know un unrelenting in its like death giving you know not in a cruel way, not in like a malicious way, but in a like, it is winter and it really is cold and there really is a lack of food. And so sometimes like the winter spirits dole out death and it's not personal in that way. It's not like a humanized um, death in terms of like, yeah, maliciousness, but just like it is winter and it really is cold. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Holda, the other deity that's more like the middle and lower um, Germanic regions, also again associated with snow and like the the whiteness of snow. And there's legends about her where she's shaking when when it snows, she's shaking out her her bed clothes and and it's the feathers that are kind of raining down. And um, again, she predates Odin. Sometimes you'll hear stories about her being like Odin's wife or spouse, but like. I think she doesn't have a spouse or she's queer. I don't know. Oh, but <laughs> the sources that I have been researching from are like pff, on that. Um, she's associated with wells and ponds, um, particularly, yeah, ponds where like children are born out of. Um, and again, we see these like old mother goddess, um, like earth goddess figures being associated with like the life giving powers of water and where, where water comes out of the earth. Um, and she's also associated with spinning linen, like flax in particular is kind of her, her domain. There's all these really cool stories about like the origin of flax and like her bequeathing that. This is both a food source and um, a fiber. And like the color blue is is tied to her in in the in that way with the blue flax flowers um and then yeah again we have this idea of like the procession of spirits and holda um and some of the lore is like who collects infants who have been lost um and so there's this idea of um sweeping the landscape like collecting the lost souls and in, in midwinter when the the veil is very thin and there's there's lots of like spiritual activity happening in in the woods and wild spaces um the procession is actually this like sweeping the land with these like they call them hordes of like undead children in the scary stories but it's also like you know collecting of of souls and beings who have who have gotten lost and, and need some support and guidance and they're on the way back into the wheel of of life and death so other things about Holda I really appreciate is she's associated as like the protector of women. She's sometimes conflated with Artemis or Diana in that way. And some of the accounts of her is that she lives in a cave with a bunch of cats. <laughs> and the cats are like women that she's saved from like shitty situations who've been like, I don't want to be human anymore, make me a cat. Which I uh, really, is, I relate. <laughs> And she's also um, associated with like summoning like angry hordes of women armed with sickles that like roam the countryside when like other women have been wronged, um, which I appreciate again. And so there's this like quality of justice, right? And, and kind of both of these deities and these stories about these deities as um, being associated with like righting wrongs um, and like really, um, carrying some bite behind the writing of the wrongs, right? That's not like, you know, it's not like a feeble, like, well, you shouldn't do that, but like some serious power behind um, the, the, the bringing in of justice, which um, a lot of those like older goddess deities have that association and then, you know, over time have been divorced from that. Kind of like the, the Kalig in Celtic mythology is um, like an old hag kind of deity 
who's also associated with like the land and mountains in particular because um and again she's associated with justice and carries a giant fucking hammer and if you uh anger this deity by acting unjustly she will smote you with her giant hammer and it will hit the land so hard that it will ricochet up the earth and make mountains <laughs> so that's like the quality of justice associated with these goddesses which i think is really interesting um and yeah and then in other regions of of um journey particularly where my i have one ancestor that i tracked celestia um there's another deity called spilla Hale that's a, a hooded hag that carries a batch of stinging nettles and will like sting people if they get out of line or something i don't know <laughs> But again, it's like winter spinning and this idea of like the procession of spirits, right? And that's kind of what this time is about, is um, gathering, um, feasting, there's a new old time, like big bonfire. It's also meant to like cleanse the both the land and the people and livestock and like our, um, you know, th th everyday things of our lives that like kind of need to be cleansed of negativity or like... Um, or wrongdoing or um, kind of like yeah older texts say like evil spirits but I'm kind of interpreting that as like a negativity or like a stagnancy that can that can happen or um, yeah just kind of like negative associations which brings me to um, the Yule Log which we know mostly I know from the TV show Yule Log <laughs> that plays that my dad used to really like to put on the TV and it's just a log that's on fire on the TV for like hours and that's it and I was like okay what's up with the Yule Log um and in looking into some of the lore of it, it used to be um at least in um Latvian regions kind of like um Eastern European regions the Yule Log used to be much bigger like a like a like big ass tree <laughs> that was rolled through the village and like people would come out and gather um like come out of their homes and like um the idea was like this rolling of this log through the villages was collecting like the misfortunes and bad luck and um you know all that negative energy through the village and then when it was burned it was to be released and then um you keep a little bit of it right to start that the next year's yule fire and yule log and that, that too kind of speaks to this very old idea of like keeping a perpetual fire um, in, in honor of the spirits and in honor of the land, um, which, yeah, they still do in um, like Lithuania and, and other regions that haven't been as um, Christian colonized for, for as long. Um, so yeah, another kind of um, commonality in some of Yule, Yule time practices is bringing evergreens into the house and then honoring uh, the land spirits of the household spirit um, in the hopes that maybe that household spirit will reward you with gifts. And that's kind of like where we get, there's like a bunch of like conflated folklore and like, you know, history and time is crazy. And like the sharing of all of those lore and getting rolled and like made into a different thing is is totally you know how what happens over over across time. But I'm curious again about like you know where did the lore of like Santa Claus come from and like what's up with with all that <laughs> and like why is it associated with this time? And um, yeah, in my research, I'm finding that uh, Saint Nicholas was actually a like Greek Christian. Um, saint who is more associated with like sailors and the sea um than like gift giving there was like a story about him where he like gave a family like a particularly a father um three bags of gold for his three daughters that were forced into prostitution because they were so poor that they weren't able to afford a dowry and that's kind of like where this association of like secret gift giving came from him but it wasn't until like much later that like St. Nicholas was kind of conflated with the idea of like, or like smushed together from Santa Claus. Cause like what's, what's older than that is this idea that, um, of household spirits. Um, some people think of them or like, can, if you like uh, imagine like a gnome, um, with like the pointy red hat and it's like, you know, the, the small being, um that's actually much much older and that was like more of a reciprocal relationship with these household deities where um and it wasn't just like at the end of the year that you tended to the spirit but like 
more as like a, a daily or an ongoing practice, like feeding the household spirit so that they would take care of the home and bring in prosperity for the family. And surprise, surprise, the household spirit was often thought to dwell in, in the hearth or like where the chimney is. And so that's why a lot of offerings were left um, on the mantle or like near the chimney because the hearth, the like, you know, the heat of the home is, is thought of in a lot of cultures as um, kind of like the heartbeat of, of the home. And so, yeah, giving gifts like cookies, but um, Percha and um, Holda, I understand, really like porridge and fish and like don't like anything else. <laughs> so we're going to leave a little porridge out for them. And um, in, in addition to like supporting the household spirit, there's also like the spirit of the land where, where you reside. And there were also traditions of like leaving offerings for like different buildings, different outbuildings like barns or like structures, but also like different prominent trees on the land. And that's again where like the decorating of the trees kind of came from. So um, not necessarily like chopping it down and like bringing it in, but like here's a tree on the land that is clearly powerful and I I would love to challenge you a little bit to think about like hmm, where around me is there like an especially powerful tree and see if you can kind of locate that for yourself even if you're in a city like what you know what what tree or what plant in your region kind of like jumps out of you is like oh like that's kind of like a really prominent part of my landscape and then that might be a great place to leave an offering for the spirit of um, the land around you and the spirit of that tree and giving that tree offerings um, was thought to bring like luck and uh, yeah, and abundance to to the region, to the land. Um, and um, yeah, and thinking too about like different associations of like colors of this time of year. A really popular offering from like time and memorial is blood um, from the like if there's animals being slaughtered for the feast right like a lamb or like you know whatever whatever livestock or um whatever is there the the blood um being a force for vitality and aliveness um that's saved and given to um to the trees as well so some people say like the red color coming from like of like the red and green christmas colors coming from like the amanita mushrooms that like old shaman men with I don't know I don't know about that <laughs> but I do know that in my lineages particularly in the Germanic lineages that red was the color of like the goddesses and, and the wise women and the wise people who um, were doing healing work um, particularly because of its association with blood and like the the color of vitality and so that's what I like to think about when I'm like kind of going through town <laughs> and seeing all like the red like you know the red bows and things and everything and then of course the green for the evergreens right the green of the trees that are still alive and like vibrant in this time of the year even when so much has succumbed to the cold um so you know make of that what you will <laughs> but um yeah there's other lore too again associated with livestock there's um the Yule goat, uh, which again is kind of has this association with um, the horned god or like the consort of the goddess, which is often depicted as like darker in color, like the fecundity of the earth and like compost and um, like really, really rich soil um, and like sensuality and sex. And so, you know, in later Christian tellings that um, kind of deity is really demonized and becomes Satan, right, with the horns and the things. Um, and then, yeah, even in, in some iterations um, became the Krampus, right? And that's another horned deity that, um, like, steals children and beats them with rods if they're bad, <laughs> which um, is scary. And also, you know... I, hard to say exactly but I get curious around like the origins of those kind of practices and deities because it's like that's again part of the some of the Krampus lore is like goes house to house you know um like seeking seeking gifts like in people will do have done that in their communities of like being in mass or being in regalia and um like seeking offerings and um and singing or going to house to house 
and it again kind of is like I believe kind of a nod to this like procession of spirits that kind of sweeps through the land at this time of year and we see that too in like different traditions like in England there's was sailing um, I hope I'm saying that right <laughs> but um, again like people kind of going door to door singing um, offering drinks in exchange for for gifts um, and then there's another um, <laughs> tradition in uh, I believe in Wales um, of Mary Lude which is like a horse spirit who speaks in rhyme it's like a horse skull that is decorated and goes from uh, house to house and uh, asks to come in in rhyme and if you don't answer back in rhyme has free license to go through your house and drink all your beer and eat all your snacks <laughs> And then in Scandinavia, there's this idea of um, jewel booking, which I hope, again, I'm pronouncing correctly. Sorry if I'm not. Um, where people, again, are wearing masks and costume, going door to door, and um, people in the community try to guess who they are. Um, and then there's, like, you know, the facilitation of, of gifts or offerings. And so, again, like, I just love that there's kind of many different um, iterations of the, of the idea of the procession of spirits. It's happening. It's coming through. Um, it comes through the land at this time of year and um, it's a great practice to honor that and to leave offerings and be in reciprocity with those spirits because they're, they're doing their thing. They're kind of going through and like cleaning the landscape of the souls that have gotten lost and need some support and clearing of the negativity and clearing of the detritus of the spiritual realm <laughs> so that we can have a fresh new lease on life in, in the spring for the turning of the wheel. So... Yeah, that's a little bit on uh, Yule and the winter deities and um, and the trees and the things. And uh, I wish you a really beautiful winter solstice tomorrow. Um, I know we'll be spending some time outside. Um, it's a great time for divination too if you do that. A good time to kind of like feel into what's here to honor about this time and this past year and everything you've survived and and where you might be headed so um with that i wish you a very warm and nourishing and safe and celebratory yule time with um hopefully lots of tasty foods and people that you love and don't forget to leave some offerings for your household spirit because i bet they'll appreciate that so with that i i uh, will see you next time take care